appreciate the work of Kelly Shackelford, our guest today. He heads the First Liberty Institute, a uh, Texas-based nonprofit dedicated to defending religious liberty and, you know, the, the, the biggest uh, law firm in the country that's particularly devoted to that question on a nonprofit basis of defending the first liberty, namely freedom of religion. Um, uh, Kelly apparently liked Baylor University so much <laughs> that he graduated twice from it, once with a bachelor's degree, again with a law degree, and so I want to congratulate you on Baylor's victory in the, in the NCAA women's uh, basketball tourney. Yep. Um, and, you know, there's even a, there's even a more important uh, brackets situation right now that uh, the Supreme Court typically gets around 8,000 cases a year uh, for justices to, to decide whether they want to take those on or not. Uh, and uh, 80 of those cases, I believe, actually make it to Supreme Court consideration. So 80 out of 8,000. Um, but there are, there are some uh, right now, uh, this year, that are bubbling, that are going to be potentially of a really uh, land-shaking importance. And we'll get to that. I want to ask you uh, first just a couple of questions that our, our world uh, legal affairs uh, reporter, uh, Mary, threw at me when I told her I was interviewing Kelly. She, she wanted me to ask these two questions in particular. Um, she writes, uh, Mary Reichardt, who is the, the co-host, let me just mention, for those of you who don't know about it, uh, she is the co-host of World's Daily Half-Hour Podcast, The World and Everything in It. And every Monday, she does a Supreme Court review. A Supreme Court review, uh, releases the audio tapes on Friday. She spends the weekend going over them and puts together what I think is probably the, the best uh, journalistic examination of what the Supreme Court did in the past week. So Mary Reichardt does that. The program is called The World and Everything in It. But her questions for Kelly are these. Number one, she writes, the ideological tension on SCOTUS bench is high, especially around death penalty and religious liberty disputes. Is it not possible to carve out some middle ground, she puts that in quotation marks, on many of these things? What's the way forward? Well, sure, there's, there's a way to carve out middle ground, but I really don't think that's the job of the court. Okay. The, the court's job is to follow the law. It doesn't matter whether they like the law. It doesn't matter whether they wished it would change. Um, and I do think we have five justices right now who their judicial philosophy is that they should follow the written word of the Constitution. It's not a living, breathing document in their view that they can change uh, to make it fit today in a way that they're comfortable with. They should follow the law. And I, and I think that's their approach. So I think on some of these cases, what we're going to see is we're going to see the court going back to the founder's intent, the, the, what the founders were doing, what the uh, documents say. And uh, I think we're going to start to see that in different ways. I think the first area we'll probably see this in a, in a really good way is religious freedom. Um, you know, uh, the last two uh, judges, to justices to join the court are Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh. And both of them have a long history of being very strong on religious freedom and, you know, the First Amendment. And I, I think we're going to see that as these opinions come out. So I, I think that, you know, sort of finding middle ground or whatever a lot of times is sort of a political, uh, you know, consideration. And I think that's really not their job. Now, I do think that a lot of the talk going on about Roberts is because he's the chief, he feels like that he has a responsibility for the court not moving too quickly. And so that doesn't mean that, you know, they're going to rule differently. It's just they might not take the biggest move case right now. They might take the one that gets them 20%, 30%, 40%, because they have 8,000 requests and they only take 80, right? So that might be the way that there's a little more of a middle ground. If they take a case that maybe isn't to change something that's wrong overnight, but it might say, this case will deal with about 20% of that issue, so let's take that case and let's begin moving towards what the Constitution really says. So they're justices, not politicians, at least... They're they should to be. be. That's the whole purpose, yes. Okay. And um, just to follow up on that, if we occasionally see reports um, of Justice Roberts or perhaps Justice Kavanaugh uh, siding with some liberals on the court on a particular issue, uh, we should not be like the 20th century Red Sox fans. I grew up as one growing up in Boston where one loss and you start saying down the drain, the season's <laughs> over. Uh, you're a 21st century Red Sox fan in that sense that you're optimistic. I am. I'm very optimistic. Um, 
Look, I, I think a lot of the things people are complaining about now with the justices is that maybe they're not taking such and such of a case. And again, out of 8,000 requests, they take 80. So the idea that they didn't take that one, there could be lots of reasons that people aren't aware of. Maybe they're waiting for a better vehicle. Maybe they're, you know. So I think what you look at is the, the actual final decisions. If you see Roberts, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, actually moving away from the written word of the Constitution and doing something that is more a living, breathing Constitution approach, that would be disturbing. Um, but that's not what he's always done, and I don't think he's going to violate his, his judicial philosophy. I just think he, he's trying to be careful to protect the image of the court. So wait, wait until the actual decisions, because a lot of what people are complaining about are either they didn't take the case or some sort of interim motion from below, like a requesting a stay or, or those type of things. And those aren't final decisions that really set precedent uh, long term on those issues. And again, I, I think that if you look at their philosophy and the approach they've always taken, you're going to find Roberts and Kavanaugh and Gorsuch and, and Thomas um, and Alito all follow a approach where they feel like they're not politicians. Their job is to follow the written word of the statute or the Constitution. It's called originalism. And, and I think you're going to see that in all their opinions. I think we're going to start moving back to really what the Constitution says, what the founders meant. And if you want to change the Constitution, they would say, change the Constitution. But don't ask us to change it. That's not their job. And I think that'll be great. If that does happen, we're going to see a lot of these really highly controversial issues begin to move away from the court and to be put back in the hands of the people where they have to argue about what they want the policy or the law to be. Okay. Uh, second question from, uh, from Mary. There's talk on the Democratic side to add more justices to the bench above the current nine. Obviously, a move to dilute the power of conservative justices is underfoot. Thoughts on that? Uh, I think that would be... Uh, it's a horrible idea. It's, it was tried last 150 years ago. Um, it's seen pretty universally as a really bad thing to try to do. If you do that, you're going to start a ratchet where then the Republican comes in and they add more seats. And then you're just totally politicizing the court and you're really ruining the court. Uh, so I don't think that, I mean, in order for that to happen, you would have to one party take control um, of the presidency, the House, and the Senate, and you would have to decide to get rid of the filibuster, um, you know, in the Senate, uh, which would change the Senate, you know, drastically. I, there are so many drastic things that would have to happen that I just doubt that will, um, but if it does, it'll ruin the court. The court will be over uh, yeah. because it'll just be, then the Republican comes in and they decide they're gonna change the court however they wanna change the court, and it's, it would just be an endless process. And even when Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Democratic president, with super majorities of Democrats in the Senate and the House in 1937, even with all that, when he tried, it turned into a huge political blunder for him. It, I think it would be a bad political blunder. But you're hearing a lot of crazy stuff these yeah. days. You know, you're hearing things like that. You're hearing electoral get rid of college. the Electoral College, which, which essentially means destroy the Senate. Um, it, when it, you know, and, a lot, and what's really weird to me is some of these people are proposing it are senators. Uh -huh. I'm like, so you, didn't, you want your job <laughs> obliterated. The reason we have the Electoral College is because there's a mixture of representation from population, which is the House, the numbers for each of the House, and the Senate, which is two for each state. And that's where that combination comes and why it's not pure, you know, just, you know, uh, a majority vote, because we actually think that the states offer something and that we like that mixture of the House, which represents the people every two years, and the Senate, which more represents the states and is every six years. And I think it's a brilliant way to do it. Uh, they don't allow like a, a few cities like New York and Los Angeles and, and you know, maybe a handful to control the country. Uh, you allow all what they call flyover country to have a significant impact as well. That's, uh, that'd be a horrible mistake. But we're hearing some of these really kooky ideas from people who want to get to their end, but their means of getting there would be highly destructive to our country. Oh, yeah, and along with it being a bad idea, uh, the amount of the opportunity for corruption yes. that would come that way, uh, stuffing the ballot box would just be enormous. And, and, and you'd have to, if you had to look at voting you know, fraud or voting issues or, or something that was close, you wouldn't just open it up to one state or one, it would be the entire country. 
You'd, I mean, it just would be a disaster in so many ways, but hopefully that won't happen. And again, I, I think and I hope that this court issue is going to become less, less relevant over time because I think the court has become more relevant because they've been taking on more of a political nature and taking issues and decisions where they've taken things out of the hands of the people that aren't in the Constitution or aren't really directly addressed in the Constitution. And if they begin to say, you know, this is not really our job. Our job is to follow the words of the statute, the Constitution, to enforce those, not to say whether you like it or don't like it. Um, I think what's going to happen is the focus will begin to r go away from the court and into the states, into the legislature where policy is supposed to be, you know, battled over. And, and I think that's resulting, by the way, in a lot of these uh, in the Congress, a lot of times just saying, well, I don't want to deal with that hot button issue. I I'm glad the court's taken it out of my hand. Now I don't have to take a stand on that. I think pushing it back down to the people who are supposed to be responsible to the, to the people that vote them in will be a great thing for the country if that does happen, as I, as, as, as I suspect it will. Yeah, um, Tim Keller and others have talked about when you think about the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is actually the quiet member of the Trinity. Yes. Uh, in our governmental triangle of, of executive, judicial, and legislative power, the judicial branch is supposed to be the quiet member of the triangle rather than the one, the That's center right. of attention. So uh, we'll go in a moment to, to the, the, the major ways in which the Supreme Court might change, namely overturning the, uh, the Lemon and Smith cases that we'll talk about. But first, just, just a couple of moments of humor of a sort. You gotta tell us about the, the Charlie Brown Christmas <laughs> censored at the, at the uh, Senior Living Center. Well, uh, this is a, a couple of elderly women who live in a government-run uh, senior uh, living facility who had some kids come through. Again, this is their home, and uh, it was Christmas. And so one of them said a natural question, which you know every school should do, which is, do you know what, why people celebrate Christmas or what the basis for Christmas is? Um, and they were immediately, the government officials immediately jumped, we're not going there. Okay, jumping on these, <laughs> these uh, elderly women like they were you know, criminals or something. And then one of them starts to read Charlie Brown Christmas. Uh, and then they realize that that would eventually get to Linus mentioning scripture. And so at that point, they, they shut it down and took, took them out and you know, really put these troublemakers in their place. Uh, and it, unfortunately, this is happening a lot. We're getting a lot of senior citizens cases right now where they're actually being banned from using their common area room for a Bible study. Um, we've actually got one case where it was a retired minister, 80 years old, and uh, he asked to use the common room and they said, oh no, not if you're gonna use it for religious reasons while well, everybody else gets to use it. Um, and he thought, well, a lot of these people can't leave. They're, they're, not in, they're in wheelchairs, they're, so I need to do something because they're asking for this. He said, oh, I'll just, I'll just do it in my apartment. I'll just hold a Bible study in my apartment. And he now has received a letter saying that he will be evicted if he holds a Bible study in his apartment. So unfortunately, as silly as this is, we're finding it, we have cases, numerous states across the country right now, where we're trying to protect the right of people who live in these senior living facilities to not be banned from anything with regard to their faith and where they live their life and where many of them are shut in. So it's a really important issue long term for the future of our country and we're very hopeful that we're gonna win that because that's clear housing discrimination on the basis of religion and it should not be happening in America. You know, the, uh, the small cloud on the horizon became a larger cloud when Hillary Clinton, uh, as Secretary of State, I think, started talking about freedom of worship rather than freedom of religion. Um, but even if you do that, even if you do that limitation, I mean, these, these folks who are immobile, they, they, even with that, they should certainly have freedom yeah. of worship. So. Can they worship even in their own home? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, the women we mentioned earlier, Wilma and Joan, I mean, they're, they're, they're reading a book to children in their home. <laughs> the yeah. government is coming in and saying, we'll not have any of that. Uh, you know, what needs to happen is the lawyer then needs to step in and tell the government, no, we'll not be having any of that. <laughs> you know, you need to be quiet because you have no right to tell somebody that they can't read Charlie Brown Christmas in their own home. Well, there's that old saying of a man's home is his castle, which obviously should be extended to women. The women's home is a Absolutely. place where they can read Charlie Brown Christmas. Absolutely. So, anyway, um, the, uh, okay, let me just ask you about one others, and this one isn't, isn't as, as, in a sense, silly as the Charlie Brown stuff, humorous to, to a certain extent, but 
when a case has the name Sweet Cakes in it, <laughs> uh, you can, <laughs> tell, tell us what's going on with the Sweet well, Cakes Well, this is uh, Melissa and Aaron Klein, who uh, she began, Melissa especially, is really good at baking. And eventually people said, hey, you need to open a, a place of business. And she eventually got to the point where she and Aaron could actually have a place of business. And they sold uh, baked goods. And one of her favorite things was to custom make wedding cakes. She always wanted to do that, though, based upon the faith and the particular things of those individuals following a biblical approach to do something where their cake, everybody's cake is different and says something about them uh, in a biblical way. And they did that. And they had two women uh, come in at one point, uh, two uh, lesbian women, and they said, we want to buy baked goods. And they said, oh, great. They loved on them. They sold them baked goods. Then they said, we want you to do a wedding cake for us. And by the way, when they asked for this, a wedding wasn't even legal in, in the state of Oregon where they lived, but they said, you want you to do a wedding cake. Well, they were very sweet, Melissa and Aaron. They said, look, we're, we'll, we'll, let us send you to some place. We can't because of our faith, but we'll send you a place that'll do a wonderful job. And that's what they did. They thought there was no problem. Next thing they know, the state of Oregon was, was literally coming after them. And the end of the story is uh, they were fined $135,000 uh, they were told they could not speak publicly their beliefs about marriage and their business is bankrupted. Uh, all because they wouldn't do a, a custom cake uh, for something that they didn't agree with. And uh, we're now at the United States Supreme Court and uh, waiting to hear any time if they're going to take this case. But it's a, it's a very important case because ultimately it's about whether people... Look, here's what I would say. People in this country have different beliefs on same-sex marriage. But the thing I think everybody agrees with as Americans is people have a right to have different beliefs on same-sex marriage. And that's ultimately what this case is, about, case is about. Can the government destroy your business because you have a different religious belief than they do about some current day issue? And that shouldn't happen. Um, I've, I'm hopeful that the court will eventually take one of these and stop all this. There's no reason for this. It's not like they couldn't get baked goods somewhere else. Um, this is a matter of sort of finding the people who have different beliefs and then trying to use the screws of the government to force them to capitulate to the government's views. And that's not necessary in this country. We're, we're plenty big to have room for people to have different beliefs. Uh, but this case would be an excellent vehicle if they were to take it to end really all these attacks around the country and stop all of these sort of test lawsuits that are being done against bakers, florists, you know, you name it. And ultimately it would help solidify that people have a right to run their business according to their faith and uh, that the government can't come in and tell them they have to violate their faith uh, or give up their business. Yeah, so that case has gotten some attention, perhaps due to the name Sweet Cakes, uh, hard for journalists to resist. Uh, let me just ask you about one more that's gotten some attention. What's going on with the case of the football coach? Uh, coach Kennedy. Uh, coach Kennedy is a guy who, uh, after, the foot, what he, after the football game, when it's all over and they go to the center of the field to shake the other team's hand, he went to a knee by himself for 15 to 20 seconds and was fired. And, um, I mean, that's, I could tell you a lot of details, but that's the summary of it. Ninth Circuit, Federal Court of Appeals, considered probably the most liberal Federal Court of Appeals in the country, it's out of San Francisco, uh, ruled in that case that coaches are not allowed to pray in public if anyone can see them. A spectator, anyone, uh, which is just outrageous. I mean, can you imagine? That means like if your coach is at dinner with his family, you know, <laughs> and he prays over his meal, that that's some sort of violation, went to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, denied cert, meaning they didn't take the case, which usually means it's over. But then something very unusual was done. They, they attached a statement from uh, four of the justices, the more conservative of the justices. And it only takes four to take a case. And they said, look, this is just cert denied for now. There's a fact we want you to get the trial court to establish back below. They said, we found the Ninth Circuit's opinion very troubling. And then they did something that was really, um, well, it was surprising to the whole country. They added a provision at the end where they said, we noticed that you have a free exercise claim, but your free speech claim made it here first. And they said, maybe that's because the Smith decision, which is a decision that's been out for 30-something years, and has been a really horrible decision for the free exercise of religion. They said, maybe that's because the Smith decision has done so much damage to religious freedom. 
uh, which is a pretty bold statement. Yeah. And then they followed that by saying, but we haven't been asked to review that decision yet, which is not subtle. Uh, <laughs> so I, 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 we're really encouraged. A lot of people are very encouraged because if you're in the business of, of filing lawsuits and protecting religious freedom, what you've been doing for the last 30 years is not bringing free exercise claims. You, you just, it, it was neutered by this decision to where it has very little impact. So what do you do? You bring free speech claims and you say this is religious speech. The idea that we're having to protect religious freedom from the free speech clause is ridiculous. And the idea that we now have justices who realize that this has been a problem and want to go back to what the founders were actually trying to do by protecting the free exercise of religion. If it happens, those of us who are alive right now will have more religious freedom than we've ever had in this country. Uh, and that would be a great thing, I think, for our country, especially at a time with so much divisiveness that there be a space for voice for people to express their faith and that people can live at peace even if they disagree. That's what the founders really wanted uh, when they founded this country. So you mentioned the Smith decision. Uh, let's talk about that and then we'll get to Bladensburg. As far as Smith, can you tell us what the decision was and what, what the results of that have been? The Smith decision, I have to go back before that. The, the, the normal approach in fundamental rights, whether it's speech or, or religion, had always been that if the government burdens your religion, then the burden of proof shifts to the government and they have to show that there was a compelling governmental interest that required it to burden your religion and that it, its burden was the least restrictive means possible to meet their interest. So that's a heavy burden on the government because we so treasure religious freedom. Smith threw the test out and said, on any law or government action that is not specifically aimed at your religion, you know, it's just kind of neutral on its face, there, you don't have to go through that test. So there's no burden on the government. So the burden is really you all will lose religious freedom <laughs> unless you can prove something very special. So it's led to really the free exercise clause being eviscerated. And if we were to overturn Smith, it would go back to that approach, which says, no, no, no. If a citizen has their religion violated or infringed by the government, the government can justify it, but it has to prove that there's a compelling governmental, like health and safety or, or something like that, and that it's really compelling and it really is the least restrictive way to get to what they're trying to do. They have to burden your religion. I think that would be a great thing for the country and that would restore the religious freedom that really the founders meant to give us and that has been gone for over 30 years now. Okay, so that's crucial. And then uh, let's, let's, head, let's head to, uh, to Bladensburg because I know that uh, we have to end pretty promptly as we go through this discussion because you have to get to the airport and, and, and head out. But uh, let's, let's, let's uh, lay the basis for it, but, but first, yeah, let's go back four decades to, to the lemon test, which is, I've always thought was, was an appropriate name uh, <laughs> generically, yes. but it's, it actually has a specific It is a man. lemon of a test for yeah. sure. Um, yeah. It's actually 50 years, basically. Okay. Um, and it goes back to what does the Establishment Clause really mean? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. What was Congress trying to do there? They didn't want, everybody really, knows, they, they didn't want there to be a national church and for people to be forced to support that church. So really what they were after is, they didn't, the church in England, they, that's, that had been their experience. So really the Establishment Clause is about not having there be a national church and not having the government coerce people with regard to their religion. Uh, that changed with the Lemon Test. The Lemon case, Lemon Test, said, used all kinds of different concepts. Um, like uh, separation of church and state, which is nowhere in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what it ended up in is, so anywhere government is, religion can't be. Well, government's everywhere. And so this is why you now see all these attacks on nativity scenes, menorahs, uh, a Ten Commandments, uh, a veterans memorial that has a religious symbol on it. Uh, the founders, I think, would be appalled at this, that the government has been turned into some sort of anti-religious liberty or anti-religion entity, like it's supposed to sort of clean the landscape 
of relig religious uh, history or vestiges or whatever, it's not what the, the Establishment Clause says. That's, that's French Revolution versus American Revolution. Yes, so. and, and it got even worse. They added to it more recently uh, what's called an offended observer approach, which means under this lemon test, and it's also called the endorsement test, if a passerby were to walk through your community and look up and see a religious symbol, and if they felt like an outsider, that's a violation of the Establishment Clause. And you're like, now you're going... What does that have to do with the establishment clause? But it's led to absurd results. And so as our case gets the, got to the Supreme Court, we not only said, look, this veterans memorial that we're protecting here that's been up for almost 100 years, that was put up by mothers who lost their sons in World War I, um, not only should you not tear it down after 100 years, which would be outrageous under the establishment clause, but... The, the, the idea that we're even here on this shows you how messed up the lemon test is and how much chaos and confusion and really hostility by the government it is causing. And numerous justices have already written about how lemon has, has thrown the Establishment Clause to jurisprudence in hopeless disarray. And even in the oral argument, um, well, Justice Gorsuch referred to lemon as, quote, a dog's breakfast. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh said something similar. Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts said, if I was a district court judge, I would just throw my hands up in the air. I wouldn't know what to do. And so I think they know this has got to be taken care of. And so in the case, we didn't just ask, just preserve this memorial because there'll be another one against another memorial. And, and this will never end. Um, we asked them, let's get rid of the lemon test and let's go back to the Constitution. And so if they're not establishing a national church, if they're not, the government's not coercing people with regard to their religion, then it's okay to have religious symbols through our landscape. We've got religious and secular symbols everywhere you go because we're religious people with a religious heritage and we don't sort of look to, to mow down the religious symbols. If, if they rule the wrong way on this case, not only will this memorial go down, they have to go into Arlington National Cemetery there are large freestanding crosses in Arlington, and that would just be the beginning of the religious cleansing. They would have to go into every community of every state of this country. They have religious symbols in all these places. And I think it would be beyond, the bulldozing, the sandblasting would be beyond anything we could, we could ever even imagine. So just so everyone's familiar with it, if you haven't heard of it, and it's, gotten, it's, gotten well, it's been well publicized, but uh, give us a little of the, the facts of the case. Uh, uh, you mentioned the longevity of the, of the cross. Uh, how tall is the cross? Uh, how, how ominous might it seem to a passerby? Yeah, this is a, a memorial that was put up, um, a World War I memorial, uh, put up almost 100 years ago, in part by mothers who lost their sons in World War I, along with the American Legion. And on it's, it's a, a cross, which if you look back in World War I, all over the world, that was the symbol that was used. And to be honest, the reason it was used is because there were, World War I was brutal. I mean, 14 million dead. Yeah. And what would happen is the pictures they would get back, it would be, because as people were dying, they would just stick across to say there's a person here. And the pictures they would get back were just cross after cross after cross all, all throughout the landscape. And so that was sort of the symbol of sacrifice and what was happening. And so they picked that symbol, which again, you'll find all around the world. They put it up uh, again, almost a hundred years ago. And it has on the, the bottom, it lists the 19 young men from Prince George's County, Maryland, which is right outside of DC, who were honored there. Really some cool facts. Um, despite segregated units, despite the Ku Klux Klan about to march on DC with 30,000 people back then, despite all the racial things going on there, that memorial has black and white soldiers listed in alphabetical order with no delineation. Mm -hmm. um, and it sat there. And what happened is it was originally on, on private land. It was on the American Legion land. And it's a busy intersection with roads around it. And so the, the government of Maryland ended up having to take the, the, plant, the park commission, took over the land, but they didn't want to disturb the memorial. So they left it there. And so years later, the American humanists come by and say, hey, wait, there's this, this big cross on government land. And... I kid you not, during the oral argument at the Fourth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals, one of the judges said, 
why don't we just cut the arms off the cross? Because that way we won't have to destroy it and it won't offend anybody uh, and we can keep it there. So this was the mindset we were dealing with. And so their final opinion was two to one. Uh, ter- you know, it's unconstitutional. And it went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court understands that not only will this affect that memorial, but Arlington is just a few miles away. And there are large freestanding crosses in Arlington as well. And they would have to come down under any logical extension of this. And really, that would just be the beginning. So I I think most people think that the court is going to find a way to uphold this memorial. Uh, We did a poll um, right before... Uh, the case just uh, Barna did it did a poll and I mean huge numbers of the country said leave it alone uh, so I think everybody understands that so the question really is uh, how will they do it will they just say well, we're gonna look at the facts of this case and preserve this cross which means we're gonna have this is gonna continue or are they gonna do something with the doctrine that has caused so much problem get rid of the lemon test um, and go back to a better approach that uh, will we'll stop all these attacks by offended observers uh, against anything with any religious imagery around the country. So the, the narrow decision, and this might be the, the quote middle ground end quote that Mary was referring to, would be, well, you can leave it up and, and you can leave up others, including at Arlington, but no more. Yeah, that's one of the proposals. What, if you understand what's going on in a Supreme Court argument, it's, it's a lot more interesting than if you're there just kind of not understanding what's going on. If you watch the oral argument in our case, uh, what you saw happening was it was pretty clear that the five justices who are considered the conservative justices were not going to tear down this, this memorial most likely. And so you began to see two of the more politically sophisticated liberal justices began to move their way and seemingly saying, well, let's not tear it down, but offer much more lenient uh, changes. <laughs> so you saw uh, Justice Breyer say, for instance, how about this? How about we keep all the ones that are already up, but we don't allow any new ones? No new crosses. Uh, and you know that's problematic because the 9-11 memorial would have never been allowed to have come into existence. You had to tear it down despite what it was and how it came up and everything. So you don't, and plus that would actually be really discriminatory against minority religions because most of the past stuff is, you know, typically a, a Jewish or Christian. And, but there are things, you know, let's say, let's say where they had this horrible uh, murder uh, in the Jewish synagogue recently, they wanted to, the city wanted to put up a menorah or a, a Star of David or, or whatever, you know, to remember what had happened. They wouldn't be allowed to. So, you know, they're trying to figure a way because they realize Lemon is in trouble. They're trying to figure a way to sort of, and so what you'll find is if this decision is like seven to two, it's probably not a very significant decision. If it's five to four, I think it will be likely to be more significant and in cleaning up the complete chaos that exists right now. And I'll tell you this, I would think if I was a justice on the, on the Supreme Court, this would be a little embarrassing. And Scalia wrote an opinion uh, where he, he called the lemon test like a late night ghoul who comes out of its grave and, and he said, we put a pencil through the creature's heart, talking about lemon, like six different justices have at times, but he keeps coming out of the grave. And we pull him out when we want to strike things down and scare people. And we leave him there when we want to uphold things. And that's what they do. They use it at times. They don't. And he said, such a somnolent monster, uh, such a monster is very helpful as long as we can keep him in his somnolent state and bring him out when we want. You know, the idea that the court is trying to figure out whether a nativity scene is okay based upon whether there's a Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer within five feet and all these kind of silly things, it's embarrassing. Um, It's not what the founders did. It's not what the Constitution says. And I think they're ready to go back. And that's why you had comments like Gorsuch saying it's a dog's breakfast. Everybody knows this is a mess. And so I, I think they're ready to clean this up and really stop a lot of these kind of crazy attacks that are going on around the country against the 9-11 memorial, against veterans memorials, against, you know, you name it, uh, that's occurring in different cases. The, uh, the Supreme Court has had a number of chances to clean it up. I mean, there was the, uh, uh, the Allegheny County case, right? Yep. This is 30 yep. years ago. Um, 
others and, and hasn't done it, in fact. And some, you can see parallels in other areas. Uh, uh, pornography, the Supreme Court had opportunities to, to clear things up and, and still has muddled. So what do, you th I'm, what do you think is going to happen here? I'm more optimistic here because a number of the justices have written in their opinions that this is in hopeless disarray. Um, they said during the oral argument that this was a mess. I think everybody universally realizes this is something that really does have to be cleaned up. Um, it's something they want to clean up, and, uh, and, I, and I think they will. I think they'll provide some clarity. Uh, the, the only issue to me is they're not sure what the new solution is. And some different things were proposed, uh, which they can modify how they want, but uh, I think they know they've got to move away from Lemon because it's just not working. And, uh, and, and again, if you're the lower court judge, what do you do? Um, the Supreme Court applied lemon in one case and then they refused to, to even recognize it in the next. So as you're a local judge, you've got to apply it. And then you have no idea because it's so subjective that you just, you yeah. could come down any way you want. And so there's no guidance for the lower court judges. And guess what that means? If you're a local official, you don't know how it would come out either. So guess what you yeah. do? You shut down all the yep. religious stuff. And so it creates a government that is hostile to religion, which is never what the founders wanted. Yeah. Uh, in a moment, we'll have time for a couple of questions from, from you all. But I do want to ask about the postage stamps. Is that, uh, yeah. You know, the talking about, about governmental hostility that goes to a ludicrous extent. Just, <laughs> just tell us about the, about the postage stamps. Well, there's uh, a lot of people know of um, like stamps.com and some of these different groups where you can actually get a postage stamp and put a picture and you can use that as your stamp. And a lot of people do that at Christmas. Well, one of the people that do that are uh, uh, people who I've known for years, uh, the Hunts, who uh, actually he's the you know, the top guy at uh, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs, okay. chairman of the board. Uh -huh. And they always do a, a stamp that's a picture of their family, um, and it's on when they send out their Christmas cards. And you can do that now. You can have your you own. You can. Print. You can. And this year, they got the weirdest response. They said it was a picture of them in front of the famous... Uh, St. Basil's. St. Basil's in, 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 in Moscow. In, yeah. in Moscow. And it's a picture of their family. You know how when you go overseas and you're in front of a historic building, you take a picture and the building's in the background? They were told they can't use that picture because there's a religious building behind them. And they said, we can use it if you'll let us cut out the building. And they're like, what? And they come to us and we're like, they can't do that. That's religious discrimination. You can't tell people they have to, you know, not have any religious elements in their pictures. And I'll be darned if there was a new postal regulation that said, you can't have anything that's offensive on your stamps. And then it said, like, and it said, sex, that is sexual, violent, or religious. Okay. And <laughs> it's like, excuse me? I don't know who came up with this, but they need you know, to talk to a lawyer first. Uh, th you can't do that. You can't, that's just pure religious discrimination. And so we're now in the process of going after this regulation because it's, it's a clearly unconstitutional and illegal regulation that has to be changed. But it's the kind of nonsense that we, we see sometimes in the country from people who think that religion is somehow not allowed in public in the United States. Well, what impressed me when I read uh, the account of that case is that uh, I went in that building uh, back when, when uh, the Soviet Union was in existence. Mm -hmm. It was a communist building. And they had turned it. The communist authorities had turned... St. Basil's Cathedral into the Museum of Atheism. Yes. So if you had a picture of the Museum of Atheism in the background, I go, that would be okay. Yeah, yeah. Right? that's exactly right. Um, so <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, now, it, now it is back as a, as a church. So, but now it's got, got time for a couple of questions from, from y'all. Yes, sir. There's a microphone. And coming. by the way, before I forget to mention this, these are students here. Um, uh, we have a couple of opportunities for students. Uh, one is a very competitive but an incredible uh, uh, fellowship program. And if you're interested, it's on religious freedom. Uh, it's, if you're interested, just go on the website. It's uh, firstlibertyfellowship.org and you'll have all the details on that. And then we also, that's just a one week program that's real intense on religious freedom. Uh, and uh, very competitive. The other is uh, internships every summer we have, usually about 20 
students from across the country, and they all get to work on the religious freedoms cases and the capacity. Some of them are law students, and obviously they can do legal work, but others can work on the media portion or all the other things that are going on. So if you're interested in any of that, firstliberty.org is the website, and again, First Liberty Fellowship is that special fellowship, and you're welcome to apply. Thank you for coming uh, to be interviewed here. Um, I had a question. Early on, you mentioned your optimism for the Supreme Court uh, passing down some key issues to the local and state level for the people to deal with. Um, however, you also mentioned numerous current instances of religious persecution at local levels. So I'm wondering, how do you think the people at the local and state level will handle the responsibility to decide? Um, on these key issues like religious freedom? Well, I think two different things are going on in the country at the same time. Um, one is the attacks on religious freedom are greater than they've ever been in the country. Um, if you go to our website or just put in a Google search for uh, do undeniable, it's a, we do a survey every year where we collect all the attacks on religious freedom and they're increasing every year. So our culture is getting more divided and there are more people who either don't understand religious freedom or don't like it and they're attacking it. So we're getting more cases. Now, the good side of that, or if there is a good side is, we've now just had 18 years in a row where we've won over 90% of our cases. So we're winning these cases. It's just, we're having to fight more. And I think the court, I do think the court is gonna return more of this freedom back and that doesn't mean the attacks are gonna be any less, but I think that's hell, maybe even a really good thing. If our culture is getting more divided, there's more hostility, there's a need for more freedom. And that'll be a really good thing for people to be able to speak the truth and not be destroyed you know, by the government in some way. Um, we need that openness because there's a lot of people that are being misled. And uh, I see this in a lot of cases where I, I look at these and I go, how short-sighted are you? You know, there'll be people that whatever their issue is, their, their issue is so important to them that they're willing to have the government shut down their opponent. And you just want to ask, don't you realize that the power you're giving the government will be used against you next? Um, so it's a lot of people are not thinking through what they're really advocating for. And so I think if this freedom opens more, which I expect it will, I think that'll be a really good thing for people to have these discussions and not take the easy out of, let's have the government shut them down because I, I really don't like what they're saying. They'll actually have to think about what they believe and they'll actually have to be a discussion and an interplay. And instead of judges in a back room deciding major issues for our country, more of that would now be in public and it would be legislators hearing from their constituents, which would all be a really good thing. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, this question I can't actually take credit for. My dad, Brian Russell, is the one who came up with this. But, um, <laughs> is that the Brian Russell I know? It is. He oh, wanted to hear from... your opinion on this. Okay. Um, and basically, it's you know they recently changed the um, regulation for Senate debate for district court appointments, you know, from 30 hours to two hours. Yes. And so he was wondering, how do you think that that'll affect appointments? And especially in the Ninth Circuit Court, do you think that'll change it and make it possibly more conservative? That's a very sophisticated question you asked there. Um, for those who don't know, uh, the judges, um, uh, one of the things that President Trump ran on was, the first president we've ever had really run on this, that he was gonna appoint judges of a particular judicial philosophy. And and he even listed his Supreme Court list of who he would choose as justice from. And, and that's really what he's been following through on uh, pretty, pretty heavily. He's appointed, he's way ahead of anybody else in his appointments uh, because they've really prioritized it. And they've been much more conservative, not in that conservative politically, conservative in that they think that they're judges, not legislators. And they think their job is to really put themselves aside and follow the words of the statute of the Constitution. Well. What's been happening is, uh, the, and by the way, I think everybody knows this, but judges are, are nominated, they're lifetime appointments, federal judges. They're nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate. And so it's only the Senate. The House is irrelevant here. Um, the Democrats in the Senate have tried to slow this down 
by what's called the 30-hour debate rule. It was a rule meant if you had a problem with one of the president's nominees to a cabinet or a judge or whatever, you could say, you know, I've got a real problem with this. Let's have 30 hours of debate on this. Um, that was used seven times in the first two years of Bush, President Bush, eight times in the first two years of Obama, President Obama. It was used 128 times in the first two years of Trump. So it wasn't to have debate. In fact, that I think the average debate was 15 minutes. It was to just tie up all the time and to keep the president from getting his nominees through, including for lower level cabinet positions. Look, I, I don't think anybody, everybody thinks the, the job of the Senate is to give advice or consent, yay or nay. Um, but when you elect a president, you've got to let them pick their staff and their, and their people to run the government. And what's been happening here is, I think, very bad for the country. Uh, the idea that all these slots in different you know, agencies are sitting unfilled. So guess what happens? The, the bureaucrats that have been there full time get to run everything, um, which is not what we want. But that's a, applied to judges too. And so there's a backlog. And we got 85 judges uh, confirmed in the first two years. I think we're up to 93 now. Um, uh, by the end of this week, it'll be more than that because we're now starting to move them through. Um, but what just changed is they, the, the Senate Republicans realized this was a bad idea to have all this backlog. Um, and this is a misuse of this rule. So they changed the rule to where now it is a two-hour debate, not 30, on the lower court judges and the lower level cabinet positions. If it's a cabinet level person, it's still 30 hours of debate. If it's a Supreme Court justice, it's still, but this will allow the backlog of 50 some odd district court judges, some of whom have been waiting two years to just have a vote. Um, they're starting to move now. So I think we're gonna go from maybe 85 to you know, 150 uh, instead. And so Trump's greatest legacy, let's say he did not win reelection. Um, his greatest legacy might be that he will have put you know, a fourth to a third of the federal judges on the court uh, of a sound judicial philosophy um, in just four years. Yeah, that would be huge. It would affect the courts for the next 20 or 30 years. And, uh, and so that change of that debate rule from 30 to two, I think is a really good thing so that vote, vote against them if you want. But the idea of clogging up things and not allowing people to be voted on is, uh, it was a misuse of that rule as shown by the numbers in the past. The other question you asked about the Ninth Circuit, um, if you've got all the, the you know, Ninth Circuit considered the most liberal circuit in the country. I don't know if that's true anymore, but it has been considered that. If you moved all the judges through that are on the list right now to the Ninth Circuit, we're only a couple of seats away from that circuit flipping from liberal to conservative. So that probably wouldn't happen in a first term of President Trump. But if he had a second term, I think it's very likely that the Ninth Circuit would change from liberal to conservative as far as the majority of the judges and their philosophy and their approach. So a lot of people are shocked by that, but that's, that's what this means in the courts of appeals and these district court slots. Um, you probably, well, we talked about it earlier. There's maybe 400,000 cases a year in the federal courts. 80 make the Supreme Court. So guess where all these, these cases are really decided? below the Supreme Court. And that's these lower court judges we're talking about, courts of appeals, district court. So that's a really big deal for the courts and what's happening in the future of the country. Oh, by the way, we have on our website, if you ever wanna go look, go to firstliberty.org, look at the bottom, look at judicial nominees. We have all the spots that, where there's open seats, people who've been nominated, where you can follow what's going on and, uh, and how the courts uh, are, are being nominated and confirmed and who these people are. I too want to thank you for sharing with us today. Have you encountered religious persecution online, say from a search engine? And second, uh, and related to that, um, where a religious organization, a church or a parachurch have been unable to say, get the proper permitting or other things that would help advance their ministries, maybe experiencing more red tape than an, another organization? Yes, I mean, big time on both. Uh, we've had a number of these you know, Facebook, Twitter situations uh, that are occurring. We had one last Easter, a church that was shut down because they mentioned Jesus in their ads for Easter. 
Okay, I kid you not. Uh, so we're seeing that a lot. Um, it's disturbing. Of course, it's different now because you're dealing with private entities uh, when it comes to Facebook, Google, Twitter, these things. And, uh, but they're really almost monopolies. So there's some people arguing that there may need to be some regulations. They're kind of like common carriers. Uh, if you want to make those guys responsible, just take out the, the current protection they have from congressional regulation that doesn't make them responsible for what's said uh, on their Facebook page or on their Twitter. That's the reason they can't be sued for what other people who are using their things say. Um, if they want that freedom to ban people because they're conservative or religious or whatever, then that protection should be taken away and everything would change. Uh, uh, so I, something needs to be done. Somebody explained it to me this way and I thought it was an excellent explanation. In the past, we used to get all of our information through really three news channels, CBS Evening News, NBC, ABC. And then the internet came and all this information started getting to people. We're now going back to just three entities like Google and Twitter and Facebook. And we gotta be careful that all of our information isn't being funneled through a couple of companies. Uh, and uh, while we don't want government regulation of private groups, we do wanna make sure that people aren't censoring and algorithming and everything else and people don't even know uh, if people had the choice, they said, yeah, you can use us, but we're going to censure your stuff and we're going to do this and that. Okay, then that's your choice. But what's going on now, I think most people don't realize, and it's, I think it's very dangerous. And so I think there needs to be a real eye and hopefully find a solution. I wish these groups would on their own police themselves. I think if they don't in a major way, I think the government's going to end up coming in, uh, which is regrettable, but I think it's, it's going to probably happen. Yeah, that's a, that's a sobering but important note on which to end. So please join me in thanking Kelly Shackelford for coming today. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>